answers you need on your listening. I'll tell you the truth about God. My eyes haven't seen him, and his hands never touched him. I've never seen the wind, but I felt the breeze today. Would you open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 20? Revelation chapter 20, we're nearing the end of the study of the full unveiling of the glorified person of Jesus Christ. And our chapter tonight is magnificent, as they all have been. And yet, interestingly, our chapter, without question, is the most debated chapter in the 22 that comprise the book of Revelation. There are many subgroups within the three main interpretations of what we're going to visit here tonight. We'll talk mainly about the mainstream uh, thinking in these three main groups. And we're going to look at a time that's called the millennium tonight. And there's been, as I said, much debate throughout the centuries, not all of it friendly. And uh, the fact is, hopefully we'll have an opportunity to examine the strengths and weaknesses of the three main positions, and I do believe arrive at a firm understanding of that which is correct. After all, that is our goal, to understand the scriptures and have the Lord enlighten the eyes of our understanding, as Ephesians says. Now, at this point in time, Jesus has returned to earth in all of his majesty and glory, and he brought with him the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God upon his enemies. We looked last week that there was a great slaughter in the valley of Megiddo that left a feast for the carrion birds, the flesh-eating birds. And we even took a look ahead into the millennium as we drew the conclusions that allowed us to understand that Ezekiel 38 and 39 is distinct from the battle that is here or was here in Revelation 19, where we made this observation during the millennial period from Isaiah 66, where we were told it shall come to pass that from one moon, from the uh, one new moon to another, month after month, from one Sabbath to another, week after week, all flesh shall come to worship me, says the Lord, and they shall go forth and look upon the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me, for their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. They shall be an abhorrence to all flesh or a ghastly sight, if you will. Now, if you remember, the beast and the false prophet have now been captured and they were thrown how into the lake of fire? Anybody remember? They were thrown alive into the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. These are, as we made the point last week, the first two inhabitants of hell. And we drew the distinction between the holding place of Hades and the final destiny of the unbeliever in the place called hell, a place that is outer darkness, a place that burns with fire and brimstone forever and ever. Now, we also noted that they're going to be there by themselves, and we'll look a little more closely at that at a second possibility here this evening, until Satan joins them at the end of the millennium when he himself is going to be thrown into the lake that burns with fire, and his work will forever be thwarted. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Now, the joining of Satan in the lake of fire after the thousand years of the beast and the false prophet, combined with the words of Isaiah concerning an unquenchable fire and a worm, if you remember, a worm is a metaphor for an ungodly man, and we made the case from several points uh, in the Old Testament for this. And the worm not dying, which is also quoted by Jesus three times in the Gospel of Mark, tell us that this... uh, belief or system of belief concerning the afterlife known as annihilationism is simply not plausible. It just doesn't hold any weight scripturally. There is an eternal torment that those who reject Christ are going to endure. Now, in between the casting of the two most evil men the world has ever known and them being joined by Satan himself as he is cast into the lake that burns with fire, there's a period in between that in the future could only be described as, and this is our title, the reign of righteousness. The reign of righteousness will be our uh, course of study tonight as we examine the millennial reign of Christ on earth. Now, 
the duration of this reign or righteousness is basically given to us through two Latin words, millianum, meaning a thousand years. And this is a phrase that is at the core of the debate as to whether or not this is a literal time period or whether it is figurative. Now, we have a lot to cover tonight, so we're going to take a look at the thousand-year reign of the righteous and see what exactly is it. Is it literal? Is it figurative? Or, as some believe, is it partially both? And the first of our, or all of our verses, I should say, will be verses 1 through 6. So would you stand and read with me, please? Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 6, as we encounter the reign of the righteous. Verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished, But after these things, he must be released for a little while. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years." But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him. How long? A thousand years you may be seated. It sounds like the Holy Spirit is trying to convince us that there is a thousand-year reign of righteousness. And I would encourage you, you should always agree with the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Now, the matter of debate in our chapter is over the, or the first matter, I should say, is over the identity of this angel. We're told, uh, John speaking, I saw an angel coming down from heaven, and he had the key to the bottomless pit, and in his hand, a great chain. And some see this as Michael, the archangel, since Michael seems to have a bit of a assigned role, if you will, of defending the nation of Israel. And we also know that the tribulation period is, as we've talked about in time past, the 70th week of Daniel. God has regathered his people, and God will, in the end, deal with his people, and God will also pour out his spirit on his people. And we made the point that in chapter 6 through 19, all the idioms and imagery became very Jewish once again, once the church had exited the scene and spent the tribulation period in heaven with the Lord. Now, we also find this to be founded upon Daniel chapter 10, verse 13, where we're told of the kingdom, uh, the prince of the kingdom of Persia. Remember, there was one Uh, who withstood the angel bringing Daniel's answer for 21 days. The prince of the kingdom of Persia, or Iran, withstood me 21 days, and behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I'd been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Now, some say it's going to take an angel of this capacity to bind Satan, and therefore they also make the case that this is possibly Michael, because of his angelic ranking as the archangel and one of the chief princes, as Daniel uh, tells us here. Now this again, it makes the assumption that an angel, a high-ranking angel, is necessary in order to bind Satan. Now there are others who hold this to be Jesus, and he is the one who has the power and authority to bind Satan, and he is taking up his Old Testament role as the angel of the Lord. And also because of the description of Jesus found back in chapter 1, some like to hold to that particular interpretation of who this angel is that descends from heaven. Now if you remember all the way back in chapter 1, I think that was in 1974 or something when we started. (laughs) We've been at it a while. This has been an awesome time together, hasn't it? Thank the Lord. All the way back in chapter 1, we found... I am he who lives, Jesus speaking, and was dead. 
And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Now, some say, well, he has the keys, so it has to be Jesus from chapter 1. And let me just say this. I don't think it is Michael, and I don't think it is Jesus. And the reason I don't think it is Jesus, first of all, is because Jesus returned in the last chapter, and we had a very detailed physical description of him that is likened unto his description in the first chapter. So therefore, seeing him now presenting himself as the Old Testament angel of the Lord would be inconsistent with his description in this very book. Now, the other reason is this. Jesus is never referred to as the angel of the Lord in the New Testament. And this is a description reserved solely for the pre-incarnate Christ. And he is distinguished from other angels who visit the earth in the Old Testament times and uh, identified as the angel of the Lord. Now, he does have the key to death and Hades. And he could have easily given to and dispatched an angel to carry out his will and unlock the bottomless pit. Now, some say that this is the angel from chapter 9, one that we've already encountered, who plays uh, a rather similar role, even though it's, in essence, the opposite of what he's doing here. In chapter 9, verses 1 through 3, we're told of the sounding of the fifth angel. And John says, I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. Now, that's key. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit, And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke, locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. Now, we noted that this was basically a demon army, so to speak, that was tormenting men for five months on the earth. They had the power to harm but not kill. And I don't believe that these are the same angelic beings in chapter 9 and in chapter 20 because the fact is the angel in chapter 9 releases demonic havoc on the earth and he is described as a fallen star. And remember, a star is used as an idiom for angels and he is described as a star fallen from heaven to the earth and it's a different word from one who descends from heaven in the Greek And also, we note that, as I said, he releases this demonic activity, and this angel does exactly the opposite. He causes demonic activity to cease by binding Satan, that he could deceive the nations no more. So who is this angel? Well, I think he is exactly who the text says he is. He's an angel. And I think he's a nondescript angel for a very good reason. I think what the Lord is wanting to remind you and I of is that Satan is limited in power. And if Jesus wants to dispatch a low-ranking angel to bind Satan, that's exactly what's going to happen. If Jesus says, go lock that guy up and put a great chain on him and seal the bottomless pit for a thousand years, then that's exactly what's going to take place. And it matters not the messenger. It is Jesus who has the power to bind Satan. Now, I think a lot of times we ask the question, well, then why hasn't he bound him already? Well, two things I can say to that. That's a question too big for our minds and too great for our time tonight. So we'll have to let it go and just know that he indeed is going to bound him, bind him rather someday. Now, where does he bind him? Uh, he binds him in the abuso, and he is chained up, and he is shut, and his prison door sealed for a thousand years. And then we're told he is released for a short time. We'll talk more about why next week. Uh, Please note, the Abuso is not the lake of fire, but it seems to be most likely a compartment of Hades in the heart of the earth that is reserved for fallen angels as described in Jude. If you remember, we have in Jude 1.6, angels who did not keep their proper domain, and please note the similarity of their captivity, but left their own abode. He has reserved in what? Everlasting change under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Now, believing that this is in the heart of the earth, that would certainly be a fitting description of a bottomless pit, as if you're in the heart of the earth, everything would be up from there. And I think that uh, is fitting uh, in, in the language there for us to understand. This is a compartment of Hades reserved for fallen angelic beings. And Satan will... Uh, visit uh, those who fell with him, at least a portion of them, when he is bound by the angels sent by the Lord. 
So Satan is now chained up. He's shut up and sealed in the abyss. And then John says, he saw thrones and they sat on them. That's a little bit obscure that John just says, I saw thrones and they sat on them. Now, is this the infamous they that we're always talking about? You know what they say? Maybe this is them. I don't know. (laughs) Now, this is a matter of debate as well. And I think we can gain some clarity here a little bit as to who is seated on these thrones. Now, some look back to chapter 4 and say, well, the thrones are the 24 that were recorded there. I'm going to give you a lot of verses tonight because we don't want to make our case tonight from opinion. We want to make our case and our position from Scripture. Now, in Revelation 4, 2 to 4, John says, Immediately I was in the Spirit, after he was told to come up here in verse 1, And behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. We made the case that these were representatives of the church throughout the ages. Now, the scene here in Revelation 4 is in heaven. The scene here and the thrones in Revelation 20 are on earth. And therefore, I do believe that there is something for us to glean from that, But I think the first thing to note is that it's a distinct set of thrones. Now, another thing for us to mention, John says that he saw this angel coming down, having the key to the pit, uh, binds him up, lays hold of the dragon, casts him into the the pit. And then John says in verse 4, I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them then. And if you pay pay close uh, attention to verse 4, you'll see that I saw is in italics, meaning it isn't in the original manuscripts. And what it actually reads is this. John says, I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them. Then the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshiped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So they're partially, I believe, identified for us here that these are the souls who had been beheaded for their witness and the word of God during the tribulation period. So therefore, those seated on the throne, I do believe, will involve uh, those from the church age. I also believe it will be uh, inclusive of those who are beheaded for their faith in Christ and the word of God during the tribulation period. And then we also can add to this in Matthew 19, 27 to 28, That Peter answered and said to Jesus, See, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? So Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on what? Twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So again, we can incorporate uh, the apostles here, uh, representatives of the church, into those seated on the throne. So we've added to the group the apostles, including those who gave their lives for the testimony of God during the tribulation period, a part of this group seated on thrones during the millennium when the earth is returned to an Eden-like condition. And that's what the regeneration uh, is referring to. Now, Daniel 7 will round out, I think, our understanding here. Verses 23 to 27 where Daniel is told the fourth beast shall be like a fourth shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth which shall be different from all other kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth trample it and break it in pieces the ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom and another shall arise after them he shall be different from the first ones he shall subdue three kings he shall speak pompous words against the most high shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law, and the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, time, and half a time, or three and a half years. So where are we at in Daniel 7? We're in the last half of the tribulation period in these verses. But the saints shall be given into his hand for three and a half years, but the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom, 
God's kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominion shall serve and obey him. So there we have the Antichrist in view. We have his demise in view. We have also the reign of Christ during the millennial kingdom in view and the saints of the most high mentioned here in association with Daniel, his city and his people give us the inclusion of believing Jews, I believe, who are going to sit on thrones as well, those who have had righteousness placed into their account. So it seems as though the thrones, in essence, are, in this case, figurative of authority and dominion. And those who are going to sit in judgment, not in the sense of eternal judgment, where they render the final verdict on souls during the tribulation, that's... Uh, not something that man has the capacity to do, nor has he been given that assignment. That's something that only God is able to do. But they will, as in Old Testament times, sit in the gate and resolve matters between feuding or disputing parties. And they will judge and render verdicts in that temporal sense during the tribulation period. So who is in view? Who are these thrones speaking of? I believe they're speaking of the saints of all ages, whether they are Old Testament saints, whether they are saints from the church age, and whether they are tribulation saints, they are all included in this particular group who is going to rule and reign with Jesus in righteousness for a thousand years. Now, there are other elements of this we could discuss, but for the sake of time, let's move forward and get into the debate a little bit. We know one thing for sure. Humans are going to be incorporated in the millennial reign of Christ on earth, and we are going to play some type of judicial rule, role and rule over uh, cities uh, as uh, promised by Jesus during that time. Now, what about this millennium thing? Does it really mean a thousand years, as the Latin phrase means? Uh, the Greek uh, seems to point to that as well. And the three major interpretations concerning the millennium are the pre-tribulational view. They are also the amillennial view and the post-millennial view. And I want to discuss those a little bit, but first give you kind of an overview of exactly what those belief systems are or interpretations are of the millennium. Pre-millennialism is the belief that Christ will return to earth physically. He will destroy the evil forces, and he will literally reign for a literal thousand years. And this time period is going to end with the rebellion of and final destruction of Satan, followed by the final judgment and the beginning of the eternal age. Now, ah, millennialism, ah, meaning no, no millennium, holds that there is going to be no literal earthly reign of Christ following the parousia or the second coming. And they believe that Christ is actually reigning now through the church. And Revelation 21 through 10 is just uh, symbolic and doesn't have any literal uh, application whatsoever. And he is simply describing here the activities of the church between the two comings of Christ. And they also believe that there is no rapture. Now, post-millennium, Postmillennialism argues that the thousand year period is going to be a time of triumph of the gospel, much like the dominion theology we covered a couple of weeks ago. And there's a period of peace that is going to precede the second coming of Christ. And again, uh, they hold to the position that there is no rapture. Now, amillennial, amillennialism is uh, the predominant belief system among those who hold the Reformed theology and uh, not strictly. Uh, all of them, but uh, the vast majority of those who hold to that particular interpretation of soteriology or the doctrine of salvation, uh, they hold to that no millennium position. Now, let's start with amillennialism. And first of all, uh, I think that there are some major hurdles, and this is not going to be exhaustive by any stretch of the imagination, but I do want to pack your notes with scripture so we can defend our position and what I believe to be the accurate interpretation of the millennium. And let me say this first of all. How many holes do you have to poke in a balloon to pop it? Just one. It's an all or nothing proposition. You've got to be spot on on all points. Otherwise, your interpretation is disqualified. So I want to poke a couple of holes in some of these things, if you will, tonight. And I do want to also add this. 
I don't think that there is any danger necessarily in holding to the amillennium conclusion, but I do believe the method of arriving at it can be very dangerous, and I'll tell you why in a few moments. I think to say there's no millennium is just simply an error. I think arriving at that conclusion and the practices, as I said, that take you there are where the danger lies. Now, first of all, the major hurdle, I think, is that Jews have long well understood the Tanakh to teach that there's going to be a messianic reign on the planet. And they were living in expectation of the Messiah coming and ruling the world. And obviously, uh, we know that there are a bounty of scriptures that would allow them to arrive at this. But let's take a look at a couple that will directly attach us to the period that is in view. First of all, Isaiah 19, 23 to 25, we're told in that day. Now remember, that's a phrase reserved exclusively for the last day's time period, the tribulation period and beyond. In that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. And the Assyrian will come into Egypt and the Egyptian into Assyria. And the Egyptians will serve with the Assyrians. Now who are they going to serve? In that day, Israel will be one of three with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the land, whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed is Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. And this is exactly how it is right now. No, not at all. Something obviously has to take place, and it is the return of Jesus and his ruling and uh, reigning over the nations with a rod of iron. Now in Ezekiel 39, 27 uh, through, through 29, the Lord says, when I brought them back from the peoples and gathered them out of their enemies' lands, and I am hallowed in them in the sight of many nations, then they shall know that I am the Lord their God who sent them into captivity among the nations, but also brought them back to their land and left none of them captive any longer. And I shall not hide my face from them anymore, for I shall have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel. Says who? Says the Lord God. Now, if you remember, the first question out of the mouths of the apostles or the disciples after Jesus' resurrection, they came together and asked him, saying, remember, they were Jews. Lord, will you at this time do what? Restore the kingdom. To who? To Israel. So they had this understanding of an earthly reign with Jerusalem as a headquarters and Israel as a predominant nation on the earth. And therefore, if the Bible predicts a literal group of people returning to a literal piece of a geography after an indeterminate time period as they are scattered among the nations, then how can this become, these literal events become figurative of the church without compromising the rest of the Old Testament text that are clearly uh, fulfilled in addressing that day. Things we're seeing happening right now. Where do you draw the line between the figurative and the literal? Did God bring his children back into the land? Did he first scatter them there? So is that figurative? No, it is literal. So you have to do some rather significant interpretive gymnastics in order to force that uh, particular position on the millennium. Now, the next problem with the Amil position is that while a day and an hour can have figurative meanings, in the Old and New Testament, there is nowhere in the Word of God where the word thousand is used figuratively. It always means a thousand, be it years or numbers or uh, people or whatever. It always means a thousand. It means one thousand. And the fact is, if they are looking at the millennium in a figurative sense, the world being dominated by the church or the church impacting the world during that period, the church has been around longer than a thousand years now, hasn't it? So that's kind of disqualified there as well. Now, the next problem is, is that if we are now in the figurative age of the millennium and Satan is bound and they believe that Satan is bound and he was defeated by the cross of Christ and death certainly was and Satan's uh, head was bruised and it will soon be uh, crushed or crushed at the end of, of the millennium. But if Satan is bound, then Peter was misinformed because Peter said, be sober, be vigilant, 1 Peter 5, 8, because your adversary, the what? Does what? Roams, walking around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. That doesn't fit the description here. 
It doesn't fit Satan being bound and sealed and shut up. It says here, according to Peter, that he's roaming around the earth like a roaring lion. Now, on top of that, the next problem is if Satan is bound in the figurative sense, then what does it mean that he's loosed for a short time? What does that mean? What happens then? Where is the foundation for that elsewhere in Scripture? What does it mean that he's going to deceive the nations? What does it mean that he's going to be eventually cast into the lake of fire with the beast and the false prophet? Or let's ask this question. What is the historic parallel to those events? And therefore, it disqualifies that interpretation and argument as well, I do believe. Now, also, add to that, I hope you see the problems are mounting. Add to that this. What do we do with the phrase, the rest of the dead didn't live again until the thousand years were over? What is the first resurrection? What does all that mean? If what we're looking at here, if there's no literal reign of the righteous on the earth. Now, the all-male position holds that what is pictured here is those who lived and reigned is simply a portrait of our new life in Christ. After all, we are new creations, old things passed away, and all things become new. And if it's talking about the life in a Christian sense existing uh, during this time period that we're living in now, uh, the figurative millianum, then again, what do you do with the live again? If you're already living in that millennial reign, then what does it mean to live again when the thousand years are finished? What figurative meaning does that particular uh, insight hold? Now, we could spend more time making a case that the Amiel position takes uh, too many hits, so to speak. There's too many holes poked in the balloon. There's too many interpretive gymnastics in order for it to be valid. So, in my mind, I should say, so let's move to the post-millennial position. Now, the post-mill believe in a partially literal and a partially figurative meaning of the verses we have in front of us. Now, most who hold to the post-mill position do believe in a literal thousand years, but they believe that the reigning and thrones are figurative of the church's dominion over the world, which usher, ushers in the second coming of Jesus, as we studied a week ago. Now, again, we'll deal with some of the problems with that. The first being 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, where Paul says, I do not want you to be ignorant brethren concerning those who have fallen asleep or died, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Bring with him where? He's coming back, right? He will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. I find that very comforting tonight, don't you? Now, the denial of the rapture, I think, is a significant hindrance to the post-mill position and any credibility as this kingdom now or dominion theology elements uh, often present it. Now, let me add this, and we've talked about this multiple times in the past. Things are not going to get better. The church is not going to have dominion over the world. Things are not going to increase better and better commercially, uh, socially, spiritually, in any way, shape, or form. Things are not going to get better. They're going to be as they were in the days of Noah. They're going to get worse and worse and worse until the righteous people on the earth are relatively few in number by comparison to those who are wicked. The thoughts and intents of man's heart will be only evil continually, as is described in the book of Genesis. Now, it is interesting. The post mill position is relatively new, a latecomer, if you will, on the scene of interpretations of what the millianum actually means. And as a matter of fact, Bible scholars, after the First and Second World War, took a pretty good beating regarding their interpretation because, hey, things aren't getting better. We're having global wars now. Things are getting worse and worse. And I do say they are going to escalate up to uh, the Battle of Armageddon someday. But let me add this. That's the least of its problems as far as an interpretive position. 
Second Thessalonians, you guys still here? Second Thessalonians 2, 5 to 12 says, Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And you know what is restraining. And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of what? Lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, if things are going to get better and better and better for a thousand years, then what do you do with the lawlessness that's described there when the church is taken out of the way? The hindering force, the purifying and preserving influence of the church by the power of the Spirit uh, that is pictured there for us. If there is no rapture, and the second coming is ushered in by the church dominating the political, commercial, and spiritual life of the world, then what do you do with lawlessness abounding and the strong delusion predicted here after that force is taken out of the way? I do have to say this is probably the weakest of the interpretive opinions, uh, post-mill that is, and like the all-mill position, it requires taking clearly literal scriptures and spiritualizing them. And then here's the danger. And like I said, I don't know that there's any high risk uh, at not believing that there's going to be a millennium, but I think how you arrive there is where the risk comes because that means that leaves the reader up to interpreting Scripture according to his own desire and will. And at many times even forcing it into one particular theological package. Now the last problem I'll mention is if Jesus comes at the end of the millennium, what's he coming to do? I mean, if the church has made the world a fitting place for his return, what's he coming back to do? Well, Peter gives us a little bit of an idea what happens after the millennium. In 2 Peter 3, 11 and 13, Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God? Because of which? Because of the day of God, the heavens will be what? Dissolved, being on? fire and the elements will melt with fervent heat nevertheless we according to his promise look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells so let's just think about that logically if the church has dominated the world if the church now has dominion over the over the world then why would jesus come back and destroy it it doesn't make sense does it okay not to me it doesn't make sense to me it doesn't make any sense it doesn't hold water. Revelation 21 says what Peter says is going to happen. The earth is going to pass away. A new heavens and a new earth will then be put into place. Now the position I believe that is valid requires a literal interpretation of the text, the one before us, uh, Revelation 21 through 10. And the position that I hold to myself and believe is the premillennial position, the premill position, the prior to the tribulation that the Lord is going to descend from heaven. The dead in Christ will rise first. Those alive who remain on the planet and trust in the Lord will meet him in the air, at which point we'll be like him. And therefore, we will be capable of sitting in a seat of judgment and reign with him for a literal thousand years when he returns to the earth at the end of the tribulation. Now, the group on the thrones make up the group John calls the first resurrection. And they're identified as a group over which the second death has no power, which also implies the other side of that coin, those who are not resurrected will face the second death. Now, Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 15 of a mystery that we shall not all sleep, uh, sleep being an idiom for death, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised out incorruptible and we shall all be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality so when this corruptible is put on incorruption and this mortal is put on immortality then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory O death where is your sting O Hades 
Where is your victory? Now listen, if we read Revelation 20 from the literal perspective that allows us to interpret 1 Corinthians 15, and we can see it as well as uh, the verses in uh, Thessalonians that we read earlier, and we don't have to try and make them fit into our own interpretation. We can just take them at face value. Listen, at the end of the tribulation, Jesus is coming back. Old Testament saints, New Testament saints, tribulation saints are going to rule and reign with him in righteousness for a millennium. Amen? Amen? Well, let's uh, wrap it up. I got a little bit more that we could discuss, but we'll just leave it at that. And uh, would you say good evening to Don Stewart? Don, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Barry? Good. All right. You know, I, I wanted to, uh, to ask you a question because I think this is a critical topic, especially in light of so much of what, uh, what's going on in the world today uh, concerning the Word of God and the disparaging of it that we've talked about so many times. And, you know, there's, uh, you know, there's good, solid, wonderful people who hold to interpretations that are, that are different than, than we do. Yes. And Bible-believing Christians and all good. that. Yeah, real good ones. And I, I think the, the real question, especially in light of so much of what is happening, the questioning of the Word of God, this red-letter movement and all these other things going on today, there's, I think there's a, a line somewhere where interpretation can spill over into heresy. Yes. And can you maybe give us a little... Uh, I don't, I, don't, I was going to say, I don't mean to put you on the spot, no, but right. you're on the spot every day on the radio, yeah, so I'm going to put you on the spot right now. Okay. Well, what are some, some ways or identifiers or even qualifiers that we can incorporate into reading different things? I mean, I read Calvinist uh, writers all the time, and, you know, it's like the old adage, you know, you uh, chew up the meat and spit out the bones, so to yeah. speak. But what are some identifiers that, that would help us and stay within the confines of safe interpretation. One of the first ones is when someone claims to have found something that no one else has ever seen in the history of the church. Mm. We've got a lot of that today. Okay. In other words, we had to wait till 2015 until somebody finally discovered something, the Word of God, or some secret hidden mystery. That's when the antenna ought to go up way high. In other words, somebody's got a mystery. Somebody's got something now that, that no one else has ever seen. And what does that do? It makes people go to that person instead of reading the Word of God, and, and that person becomes, because they found the mystery, now they become sort of almost like a divine interpreter for the rest of us. That's huge, and we're seeing a lot of that today. So that, that's one of the things that's very troubling, because you've got people out there making these claims for themselves that they found something of this mystery or whatever, and people that don't know any better, not reading the whole Word of God, are following that. And that's, that's just not right. I mean, there's an old saying, if it's new, it's not true. If it's true, it's not new. You know, because the last 2,000 years, you've had brilliant minds uh, look at the Scripture, check it out, interpret it, examine it. And um, I guess they all missed it. And, and so one of the things, too, this is where it gets heresy, but also all the cult leaders, Joseph Smith Jr., Charles Taze Russell, the Jehovah's Witness, same thing they did. You know, they saw things that were never there before, got re revealed stuff. So that's one of the things that really bothers me because, Barry, what it does, it infiltrates our group, our people. and got a lot of people going after these rabbit trails, and it takes them off the path of the straight and narrow. That's the main thing that gets me. It's also really popular today, I think, to just to limit the scope of, you know, at least the initial Christian experience to uh, just a moment of agreement with God yeah. or a, a sinner's prayer or a walk down an aisle or raised hand or, or something like that. And, and it's very popular. I think a lot of us on social media will see those types of things. Well, you know, as long as you believe. I mean, it's all you got to do is just believe, you know, in, in the understanding sense that Jesus existed and, and you've kind of sealed the deal. And and uh, where can we maybe come to a little bit deeper understanding of belief? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good one because uh, what happens is, John chapter 3, Jesus said you have to be born again, born from above. And 2 Corinthians 5 says anyone's in Christ, they're a new creation. Uh, all things, old things have passed away, new things have come about. And uh, when a person's truly converted, and again, this is something only God knows, um, something will change in their life, some more than others, but something will indeed change. The problem is you've got people that say on the one hand, you know, uh, like you said, just kind of an intellectualist said, that's it. 
But on the other extreme, not only do you have to believe it, you have to you know, jump through all these hoops to not only be saved, but continue to be saved. And the truth is, is, is neither of those. It's, you know, God says, if you believe, you really truly believe, you're saved. You won't get any more saved the moment you come to Christ. But when you be, you're saved in three tenses. You have been saved, justified. You are being saved, set apart. You will be saved, glorified. So right now, all of us are being saved. We're being set apart, being more Christ-like, and eventually we'll be like him, Romans 8, 29, when we're glorified. So that too, you know, again, balance and try to get the totality of the Word of God on that. Yeah, amen. Hey, there's something coming up on September 12th. Uh, let's see, September 12th. What would that be? That would be over in Calvary East Anaheim and... Uh... Oh, that prophecy conference. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's the date. Yeah, th yeah. And back, you're one of the main speakers at that. There is a great conference. You guys all ought to be there. Calvary East Anaheim on a Saturday. And Barry's one of the speakers. I have the privilege. Uh, by the way, I teach out there on Thursday nights. I'm doing a series there in case you didn't know, at least I'm, from time to time. And Bob Copenny, the pastor, asked me uh, to, put a pastor, to put a prophecy conference together. Who to have? And, of course, Barry was my first suggestion to have him speak. So, He's going to be introduced to that group. Uh, Tom Hughes from 412, James Cadiz, and myself. Jack Hibbs will be speaking also there, and uh, Charlie Campbell on that day. So it'll be a, it'll be a really good day. And uh, you guys don't have a Saturday night service, do you? Nope. Okay, then Saturday night there's a service there too, which yours truly will be speaking at it. And so, uh, you know, it's, it'd be a fun day. And you ought to go just hear uh, the different guys speak on that because it's going to be a, it should be a really interesting conference. And it's the first one they've tried, and hopefully it'll be many, many more. So that's going to be, yeah, it's going to be fun. Yeah, it'll be great. Looking so put it on the calendar. It'll be yeah. a great day. September 12th. And let's spend together. Yeah. So, questions? Dave's got one. Someone handed me this question, so. Okay. Someone handed you handed the question? Handed you the question. Yes. <laughs> okay. This is uh, from Carolyn's brother. The guy from Georgia who's not here? He's a nice guy. He's a good guy. Okay, you ready? Since Satan is in the abyss during the millennial period, who tempts those who are born during that time since Revelation 20, uh, chapter 20, verse 3 says that he won't be deceiving the nations till the end of the thousand years? If they are tempted while he is in the abyss, why release him at all? Good question, Barry. I've been up here for a well, no, I, I just answered the last question. It's your turn. <laughs> I'm, no, go ahead. Well, a couple of things come to mind. First yeah. of all, you know, we don't see, um, you know, we see his deception at the end of the millennial uh, period. We know he's released yeah. for a short time. And there are going to be people, and there's a, you know, this is one of the things I didn't get through tonight. There are those who believe that during, uh, you know, the millennium, it's only going to be believers that enter in. Uh, we know that two-thirds of the Jews are all going to be wiped out during the tribulation period, and only believing Jews are going to enter in, and then it'll be followed by the separating of the sheep and the goats uh, at the outset of the millennial reign. So only believers will enter into the millennial reign of Christ, and those, you know, obviously are going to procreate, and there'll be kids born throughout that season. And I think on top of that, you know, we have to realize that James tells us that each one is drawn away by his own lusts and enticed. You know, I think a lot of the times we give the devil more credit than he's due. Yeah, much and uh, we forget that uh, the heart of man is deceitful above all things. Uh, who can know it? And the Lord, as Jeremiah says, he weighs the heart. He knows the heart. So, you know, I don't think man needs a whole lot of help to be evil. No, that's, that's of course, the right answer. We still have the old sin nature. That's enough right then. Now we won't have the tempter. They're tempting us, but we can do enough in ourselves to do it. We won't have a world system either who's against us because Christ will be ruling. And so two of the enemies are, are gone, the world system that's anti-Christ and Satan himself, and yet we'll find enough things in, our, in and of ourselves to sin. So sin will be kind of you know, much lower, won't be as active as it's going on because of all the, all the things going on at that time, but there will still be that, that sin nature there. And that's what's really going to come about at the end of the millennium. So that's a great question, by the way. And again, the, the Bible doesn't say anything specifically about it. We just have to kind of put things together to understand that. But the fact that we still have a sin nature, the people have a sin nature, is, is the answer. Because two of the three enemies are uh, put by the wayside. And we see during the millennium, you know, there is evidence of the rebellion of man, you know, because there are times where... You know, we're given one example where, you know, if the Egyptians won't come up and offer their sacrifice to the Lord at the Feast of Tabernacles, then they'll have a drought, yeah. you know, that, that they're going to encounter following 
of that act of disobedience. So we know man is still man uh, during the tribulation. And then, you know, Don, let me ask this question because sure. this is a biggie. And, um, you know, what, what happens with their, their varying positions on the believers that enter into the, the uh, millennium who survive the tribulation? Mm -hmm. And what, is there any type of evidence in Scripture that tells us that they're going to live as they did in the antediluvian period, or are they going to receive glorified bodies, or you know what's going to happen with believers who survive the tribulation? Yeah, that, that's a good question. They'll eventually well, two things. They'll eventually either have to get a glorified body sooner or later. Some people argue with Revelation when we get to the 21:22 that the tree there for the healing of the nations, for the health of the nations, is sort of like the original tree in the Garden of Eden. The, the things will be you know like pristine conditions and they'll continue to eat those out of that fruit to live forever. Now, that's not us. That's the ones that can't. We just don't know. We're not, we're not told an awful lot about it, so people surmise on that. But bottom line is we just don't know how long they'll live, um, you know, when they'll, they'll be, have a judgment for themselves, too. The, peop, the people that grow up during the millennium, they'll have to be separate the sheep from the goats there, too. Uh, the great white throne will be unbelievers, but uh, there are probably believers there, too, who made it through the millennium. Sometime they have to at least receive some rewards, but we're not told specifically about that, so we just don't know. But something happens because we're told, Isaiah tells us that a child will die at 100 years Correct. old. So, Correct. You know, there is some return to the you know, initial state, I guess? Yeah, to, to some degree, correct. Yeah. They're going to live yeah. much longer. Do they live, some people argue they live through the whole millennium. You know, they never yeah. die. We don't know that. We're not, again, we're not told, but we do know that there will be people who do die. But age 100, you're, you're a child if you die at that time. So the, uh, the inference is people live the most of the time or maybe all of the time. Again, just not enough information on the subject. Great question, though. When I was married, this was before I knew all the scripture, and it's always been the bride is up waiting for the groom. And now that I know the scripture, are we doing marriage backwards? It seems like the groom should be up there and the bride should be coming down. I know the ladies won't like that, but <laughs> based on scripture, because we're the bride and we're waiting for the groom, and that's Jesus. And even in the scriptures, it talks about, you know, when... The bride's always waiting for the groom. So are we doing the marriage backwards? <laughs> <laughs> the ceremony? Did you get that? I didn't get it. Uh, the no, marriage I, ceremony. I, I, don't know. I don't know which. I don't know. Is the marriage ceremony backwards where the groom should be up front waiting for, uh, excuse me, the bride should be waiting for the groom. Right now it's the bride is here and the groom is uh coming in. So I, I'm thinking the groom should be the front and then the bride coming in. <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, is, is, uh, I'm, I'm just yeah, pointing I, out I scripture. I don't know that I'd be drawing any comparisons no. between the modern no. wedding ceremony no. and scripture. I think it's just, no. No. just our traditions. Yes, ma'am. Get up mic. to the mic, please. Is Melchizedek uh, Zedek um, uh, the one who met Abraham when right. uh, he was coming from rescuing Lot, the same thing mentioned in Revelation, are they the same Jesus? No, Melchizedek isn't mentioned in Revelation. He's only in Genesis 14, the 110th Psalm, the 7th chapter of Hebrews, only three, three times in Scripture. And he's a type of Christ. He's made not, likened to not Jesus. Jesus. No, no, no. no. Uh, some people think he is, you know, because of that, but it, it seems a better interpretation. I think you agree with Barry. He's, he's a type of Christ, made like unto the Son of God. Yeah, he's a typology. Hebrews 7, three, type. Yeah. 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 And do you also think that Holy Spirit will be visiting uh, the, Isra uh, the Israelis during the millennium? Yeah, Good. that's a great question. The whole work of the Holy Spirit during the millennium. Uh, that's your turn to answer that one. I, I didn't hear that we, question. Yeah. <laughs> what, what would be the work of the Holy Spirit during the millennium? Well, I think, you know, the, the, the Lord isn't, you know, well, first of all, John 6, 44 says, no man comes unless the Father draws Correct. him. You know, so the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, my understanding is that his ministry is going to return to that which it was during the Old Testament period 
It won't be the, the church is exclusively the only group that has had an experience of indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You know, the men of old, men of renown, had the Spirit come upon them and move them as they penned the scriptures. And we know others were anointed uh, throughout the, the time. But, you know, it, the indwelling of the Spirit is exclusive to the church age. It's, yeah, the, the work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament is really a tough question because, um, and there's, there's not enough, infor, not a whole lot of information on it, just like it's a great question on the millennium. Um, you can't really follow the Lord without the Holy Spirit, so they weren't following him in the flesh. Just exactly how he worked in the Old Testament is some, somewhat different than the church age, but to the degree it's different is, is you know, kind of up for grabs because we're not told an awful lot about it. And so... Uh, um, in the millennium, the same type of thing will probably go on. Now, the good thing is, again, again you got two of the enemies gone, Satan and the, the world system. we got the flesh. The Holy Spirit will be working in some way. But as always, he's behind the scenes. You know, as Christ is the one glorified. And so that's one of those, another question that we just don't have really a whole lot of information on. Excellent question, though. i got a question if nobody else has one here. Oh, we got some. Oh, oh. Uh, Billy's going to have one, he looks like. Thank you again for teaching on Hades last week. I'm like a school kid. <laughs> Probably everybody else here knew the answer that Hades is before hell. I didn't know that. <laughs> and I praise the Lord that I learned it. The book of Lazarus uh, and the poor man and the rich man. Lazarus went to the bosom of Abraham and the rich man died and was on the other side of the chasm. <clears throat> And he said, Father Abraham, why are you there and why am I here? I'd like to come to where you are. And he said, no, my son, that can't happen because we're here and there's the chasm, there you are. He said, well, then I am in great torment. Please send Lazarus to touch my tongue. He said, can't do that, my son, either. He said, well, then tell my brother. He said, we can't do that. They have the prophets from Moses. Um, we know hell is a very hot place and a very dark place and a very place of torment. Then, because of what he said to Abraham, please have Lazarus come to, shall we say that even Hades also was a very, very tormented and a very heated place? Big time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You, look, yeah. Look, you look at Luke 16, which uh, shows there's, there's a whole bunch of things that Luke 16 tells us about the in-between state. And um, none of it's good for the unbeliever, none whatsoever. You know, mm. he has a memory, he's conscious of who he is, who Lazarus is, who Abraham is, that he had five brothers, that he's mm. there, that he mm. deserved to be there. It's funny, too, how he hasn't changed. He still thinks he can summon Lazarus like he did when he's on earth. It doesn't yeah. work that way yeah. now, does yeah. it? Praise and uh, he's surprised because he's a rich guy. And according to the thought in the first century, all the rich people are blessed by God, so they're going to be with the Lord. The poor guys are going to be the other direction, and so the positions are reversed. A lot of fascinating things we see that from Billy. Excellent question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's not an easy place to wait. No, no, <laughs> especially what they're waiting for, too. Um, could you just elaborate on this? And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the, obviously the ones who didn't take the mark, they lived and reigned with them. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Yes. What rest of the dead? The ones that died during the tribulation? Because we've already been raptured. No. Yeah, explain that, please. Okay. Go ahead. Good. Your turn. Okay. Well, this is the first resurrection. I mean, this pulls the curtain down on the first resurrection. And, and uh, 1 Corinthians 15 says the Christ is coming in stages, okay? Uh, he's, he's the first to be raised. Then those at the rapture of the church will be raised from the dead. Uh, then those are, who are alive are caught up. But when he comes back at the second coming, you've got the tribulation saints and the Old Testament saints raised at that particular time. That pulls the curtain down on the first resurrection. The rest of the dead don't come, aren't raised for a thousand years. Unfortunately, Barry's going to get to it in about a month or two, or in, yeah, yeah, probably like whatever. Um, when in he gets the new building, in the new building, about. when he gets to <laughs> yes, uh, yes, and the, the fourth year of the new building will finish Revelation. But anyway, uh, <laughs> that's an optimistic view. But then you got ten to fifteen. The dead are raised to be judged, and those are the ones that are going to be raised a thousand years later. You want to participate in the first resurrection right. because, the, that, because the second death will have no power over you. That's what it's talking yeah. about there. 
The second resurrection is the resurrection of the unbelieving Yeah, God. yeah. Exactly. And they stand before the great white throne. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm about to embark on reading, and I just wanted to get your thoughts on it. I'm the sinner, a sinner in the hands of an angry God. What do you think about that book? About Jonathan, Jonathan Edwards? Edwards? Yes. Yeah. Stay away. Don't. Well, Jonathan it, Edwards, it's interesting because there, it's, when you read Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, it was based on, I believe, a message, message he gave there. And when you read it, 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 it scares the daylights out of you because he really goes and, and tries to scare people because of the, his depiction you know, of, of hell. But from what we understand, Ed, Edwards did not have much of an imposing figure, and he spoke in a monotone voice. So it wasn't like, you know, he wasn't like Billy Graham or someone that said, sinners in a hand of an angry God. You know, he, um, he would be more like, um, you know, he would sound like, um, you know, some type of, you know, robot or something speaking as it were. But the words were rather, yeah, rather profound and it's a very famous message. Uh, well, my father-in-law read it and mm -hmm. he keeps on reversing, referring to a verse and it's Proverbs 1, 24. And it, because I have called you, refuse and I have stretched out my hand and no longer, and you know, and no one no longer regarded because you disdained all my counsel and would have none of my rebuke. I also will laugh at your calamity and I will mock in your, when your terror comes. Is that God speaking? Because he says that in that book, God holds you by a spider string. And if you, if he, he holds your life like a, you know, a string of a spider web. So he referred back in that book, he referred to that as like God mocking at you. And my mother-in-law was like, no, God's not going to be mocking at us. He's like, yes, he is. It says it right here in Proverbs. <laughs> well, that, yeah, that's very, that's earthly. What's going on here? God yeah. is for the sinners that are living right now. No, and, and that's the mistake people made. They think, well, because God does it now for the unbelievers here on earth, the sarcasm, that's going to pull over to the next life. There's, there's no indication in the afterlife that God does something like that. That's one of the many misconceptions people have about the afterlife and hell. They use analogies from the Old Testament or for that. In fact, you are very correct, Barry, on the, the doctrine of annihilationism because the wicked are destroyed, therefore they're annihilated, no longer exist in the afterlife. Um, it's just not, not biblical, not true. And so uh, this here is basically speaking about people who are living. It's not, the afterlife is not in view there, so it's really irrelevant to the question. Same type of language in Psalm 2. Yeah. Why do the nations rage? Why do they plot a yep. vain thing? You know, the Lord is going to laugh at their efforts. You know, I think we have to balance this out with that he is, uh, the Lord takes no pleasure no. in the death of the wicked. You know, his preference is that they would repent and live, you know, so. Good question. Don's got breaking news here for us. Which one? That one right there. Well, that one, did you see, there was a, there was a, a I'm glad we're going to leave Barry answering this. There was a headline today they put in the Drudge Magazine from Charisma News. And here's, here's the question. Why do so many people think that Pope Francis is the Antichrist. Yeah, okay. Uh, in fact, uh, if, you, if you type, is Pope Francis the Antichrist into Google, you'll get 425,000 results in 0.37 seconds. <laughs> yeah. So Barry, for the time remaining in the next 90 seconds, please explain why this is, why do people think that? Let's stand and pray. Yeah, okay, yeah, I think so. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> Father, again, we're so thankful, Lord, for your word, and we are grateful to know all the things that are necessary for us to know, and, and Lord, the, uh, the things that you have left unspoken in your word, uh, God, don't change the fact that you sent your son to die for the sins of the whole world, and through him the whole world might be saved, Lord. So we, we thank you for your great love, and Lord, may we express it in all that we say and do in these closing moments of history, and uh, Lord, give us a great passion for those around us perishing that they may come to the saving knowledge of Jesus uh, through our efforts to reach them and the drawing of your spirit, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>